Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Nigel Brandon uh, and it's my great pleasure to uh, open up um, today's and, and this evening's event. Um, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial College London and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, I am charged with giving you some housekeeping announcements to start with. Uh, firstly, as you will have seen, I think, in the slides that have just been rolling while you've been waiting, the event will be recorded. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions uh, around each presentation, each talk. You can submit those via the Q&A facility on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if you do not want your name to be associated with your question, then you can select um, to post anonymously if you prefer to do so. So with those housekeeping points out of the way, let me formally welcome you here to this virtual meeting uh, uh, and to welcome you to Imperial College and in particular to welcome you to the Sargent Centre for Process Systems Engineering. Um, the centre has a world-class reputation for its work in developing systems engineering approaches to address complex and strategically important problems across a range of industries, uh, enterprises and society at large. Um, to do this, it combines resources from engineering, computing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, molecular sciences, mathematics and business and works with an outstanding range of external partners, both academic partners and uh, in very uh, key stakeholders in industry and government. Um, the centre is based at Imperial College London and University College London. Uh, it's the largest academic centre of expertise in the world in this area. Um, certainly, in my view, uh, the centre embodies Imperial's mission uh, delivering world-class scholarship, education and research in systems engineering and has pays particular and very important attention to their practical application and impact. And indeed was recognised by the college through the award of the President's Medal for External Engagement and Partnerships, recognising the strong collaborative ethos of the whole team. The breadth of the work undertaken is remarkable. Um, Sargent Centre researchers develop approaches uh, tackling a range of global challenges from decarbonisation of industry and the economy at large to vaccine manufacturing. Uh, today's lecture uh, is the flagship annual event of the centre. It honours Professor Roger Sargent, founding director of the centre who sadly passed away in 2018. Um, today's event is especially important uh, and an especially important celebration of Roger's legacy, uh, as today we officially launch the centre's new name as the Sargent Centre for Process Systems Engineering, uh, formerly known as the Centre for Process Systems Engineering or CPSE. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this event, uh, noting that particular recognition. We have an exciting set of speakers to celebrate systems engineering with you today. Um, it certainly promises to be a stimulating event, a stimulating evening, and I hope it will generate new ideas and connections as well. Um, with that, I, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Professor Claire Adjaman, Director of the Sargent Centre, to introduce the programme and the Sargent Lecturer. Claire, over to you. Thank you very much, Nigel, for this welcome and welcome to uh, all of our audience today. Thank you for joining us. We have indeed a very exciting event and it's a very uh, special evening for us all at the Sargent Centre. Um, so as you will have seen uh, in the slides at the beginning of the event, we will have the 27th Roger Sargent Lecture. Uh, this will be followed by a brief history of the centre, which uh, I will deliver. Unfortunately, Nilesha is not uh, able to join us uh, today, so I will deliver that. Uh, and then we'll have a, a very intriguingly titled talk by uh, Professor Dan Murphy Calder. Um, and uh, this will be followed by a panel discussion with four panellists uh, chaired by uh, David Bogon, Deputy Director of the Centre. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, Yanis Kevekidis, who is our 27th Roger Sargent Lecturer. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him. I've known Yanis for a long time, since uh, I was a PhD student at Princeton, where he was a professor. And uh, I know from experience that all conversations with Yanis are very thought provoking and certainly his talk uh, looks to be uh, as well tonight. So 
Um, Yanis studied chemical engineering at uh, the University of uh, Athens and then went on to do his PhD at the University of Minnesota. He worked with uh, some of the greats there, uh, in particular Rutherford Harris and Lani Schmidt. Uh, so he has an impeccable academic pedigree. Um, he then went on to uh, work at Los Alamos for a while um, before joining the faculty at Princeton, where he stayed for 31 years. Uh, and then four years ago, he moved to Johns Hopkins, where he remains a, a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Nothing new there, but surprisingly, he's also a professor of urology, and perhaps he'll tell us a little bit about that tonight. It's very, it's very surprising, certainly. Um, Yanis's main focus is on nonlinear dynamics and his research that area for uh, throughout his career, uh, but looking at different aspects um, of this um, through his work, uh, with data uh, coming back, uh, popping up uh, now and then in his work, and certainly a big topic currently. Yanis's uh, work has led to him receiving a vast number of awards. Um, from the AICHE, for instance, he holds the Colborne Award, the Cast Award and the Willem Award. He's received prizes from uh, SIAM as well, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering in the US, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and of the Academy of Athens. Um, Yanis, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. Um, Yanis's talk is entitled No Equations, No Variables, No Space, No Time, Data and the Modeling of Complex Systems. Yanis, over to you. You are muted, Yanis. Thank you. So now, now, now you can see my slides. Um, yes. We have no slides at this moment, Yanis. Okay. One more. Does this work? We tried it before. <laughs> I apologize. Wait. Hold a moment. Do you see my slides yes, now? We can see your screen now. OK, very good. Thank you. Sorry for the glitch. So the, the, so this looks OK, Claire? It looks perfect. Very good. Thank you. So yes, it's a, it's a funny title. I'm really sorry to not be able to be there. Um, I have been at Imperial many times. There is lots of our students there, like Professor Rajiman and also Ruth Messner and uh, Omar Matar and Jay Krishnan who works with me and uh, there's lots of friends and collaborators. Serafim Kaliadasis is one, people in math like Greg Pavliotis and uh, anyway, it's, it's a wonderful place. It's uh, wonderful to visit and talk and work with people there. And I should say that I, I, I never really had the, I really regret this. Uh, he has of course uh, affected my life and career a lot through his work and through his students and uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren, but I never had the chance to talk with him. And um, I asked some of my friends when I knew that I was going to give this lecture, which is a great honor for me. And one of the things that they told me was that, of course, he was one of the first people who understood that computer scientific computing and numerical analysis is a great link between the sciences and engineering. But also one of the things that all of his if you want collaborators, students uh, have told me, is the thing that I put in red at the bottom, that one of the main things that is his legacy in addition to his work was the inspiration that he provided to people. And so it's a real honor to talk today in his name. Uh, I know that this is the picture that you have at the banner of the sergeant lecture, but I also went to Wikipedia today and it, it has it with a funny, you know, legend. It says, how he, he seems to be smiling after attending one of the Roger Sargent lectures. I don't know which lecture this one was. Um, what I want to talk to you about is data-driven methods for modeling. Uh, so in, in a sense, it's a little bit medieval. Uh, instead of 
understanding and first principles methods for modeling. It's uh, data driven methods for modeling. And my standard example for an equation free demo, what I call equation free, is this little model for clustering and steering in plankton that was done, among other things, by a friend of mine, a collaborator, a very bright Australian mathematician called Tony Roberts. So what I want to show you is two movies of the same thing. On the left, you have uh, 20,000 little dots. Each one of them is supposed to be a plankton microorganism. Think of it as the molecular or microscopic picture. Each one of them that makes a random work, walk, each one of them uh, uh, gives birth and dies. Each one of them is swished around by the ocean current at the surface of the ocean. And then on the right, what you see is the macroscopic statistics of interest. Uh, which happens to be the pair correlation function, which is how many neighbors do you have as a function of your neighborhood size on average. And let me play the movie. I want to make a simple point. The simple point is that what you see on the right and on the left, forgive me, let me run it again and stop it. What you see on the right and on the left are two views of the same thing. It's just that on the left, again, apologies, on the left, it's a terrible mess, while on the right, what you see is something smooth like a partial differential equation that goes to a nice steady state, maybe with a little bit of noise. And this is a general theme that we have microscopic models of macroscopic systems, and the real dynamics is a terrible stochastic collision mess, but what you do derive in order to be able to do good engineering calculations is macroscopic equations for the right macroscopic quantities. So in order to be able to work macroscopically, in order to do the Navier to, to do fluid mechanics, you do the Navier Stokes. You don't do molecular dynamics. In order to do mechanics, you do the formations and stresses. You do not really do molecular dynamics again. So there is a very important bridge between the microscopic, complex, interacting particle, agent-based molecular stuff and the macroscopic level at which we do our equations and design and optimization. And uh, if you have these equations, great, but what happens if you don't have these macroscopic equations? And so this is something that we started a long time ago already. It's 20 years now. The idea is that you have a microscopic simulation based on particles. You would like to do macroscopic calculations, but you don't have the macroscopic equation. What can you do? Um, an interesting thought is if you go to the computer with an equation and you want to do something like integrate, then if you have an initial condition at the macroscopic level, like a pair correlation function, then the equation would give you the right hand side and the right hand side would give you the derivative with respect to time. And you could use this derivative with respect to time in order to make a big jump. Uh, but you don't have this equation, so you don't know how to calculate the time derivative. The idea then is to use the microscopic simulator as an experiment run the microscopic simulator for a short burst, maybe several parallel short bursts, estimate the time derivative on the fly with the same identification tools that you would use if you were observing an experimental experiment, and then using this time derivative, make a big jump. Then take the new macroscopic initial condition, make it particles, run the particles for a brief burst and jump. So the idea is, even if you don't have a macroscopic closed equation, you can use the idea that the equation exists, the concept that the equation exists, to design intelligent short bursts of computational experiment that can save you a lot of space, time, and parameters in being able to get to the macroscopic result. You can also already maybe see that this is a bit uh, a misnomer. It's not really equation free. You do have equations, but at the microscopic level, it's the macroscopic engineering level equations that you don't have. Um, then the next step is uh, what one might call variable free, which if you notice the little example that I told you, I kind of told you that Tony Roberts, my friend and collaborator, had already said, you know, you should really observe the pair correlation function. So we already knew what are the features of the macroscopic solution that are of interest to us. In general, if you have a microscopic simulation, an atomistic one, an interacting agent based one, a network simulation on you don't really often know what the macroscopic important features are. How do we go from very detailed simulations to macroscopic coarse grained features? Uh, typically, you can use Fourier modes or moments. I mean, you have a cloud of points. You, if you have a distribution of points, you can use enough moments. Uh, the other thing is to either have a lot of experience in observing something versus being really, really very bright. 
and being able to, let's say, take the Boltzmann equation and go to the Navier-Stokes. Uh, I think it's important to say something on this. Usually, if you have somebody who has worked for a lot or long time in a plant, they have a very, very good idea out of all the million variables that they observe, which are the few things that really matter. So this is a case in which your brain has done the data mining, if you want, and has figured out out of the many, many observables, which are the ones that are really relevant or dangerous or important for what you're interested in. So this can come from brilliance or experience. But then this is the thing that is a big difference today. We can use machine learning, data science, if you want, data mining, if you want, manifold learning, if you want. My particular poison is diffusion maps, but there is lots of lots of very interesting techniques. There was a if you want, there was there, there was an amazing thing that happened in 2000. There were two back to back papers in the journal Science. Uh, one of them was on isomap and the other one was on local linear embedding. And what they both did is that they described how to systematically get low dimensional descriptions, not only with principal components, but if you want with nonlinear principal components. So you don't have to have that much experience. You don't have to be so bright anymore. You can go to the computer science department learn tools for manifold learning and that will tell you what the right variables are at the macroscopic level. So for 120 years or so, we know that we can reduce data through principal component analysis. Here you see you go from three dimensional data if they live on a hyperplane to two dimensions. But then what happened in 1991, uh, Mark Kramer, this is to the best of my knowledge, Mark Kramer, who was then a professor at MIT, who did not get tenure. Uh, uh, published a paper on what he at the time called nonlinear principal components, which are today's autoencoders. And so the idea is that you can get a high dimensional representation, pass it through a bottleneck layer, and then if you can successfully train such a network to learn the identity, then you have an encoder from 40 to 3 and a decoder from 3 back to 40. Of course, today there is wonderful extensions, like for example, variation autoencoders, just to say one, but the main idea a nonlinear extension of principal components is something that has been around for at least 30 years in this form. And then one of the things that happened around again 2000 is more mathematical ways. What do I mean by that? The problem that I showed you in the last slide, how to get good coarse observables or features from high dimensional data, this is a nonlinear non-convex optimization problem. No guarantees that you will converge. While what I'm showing you now, which comes from around 2003, from the work of Rafi Koifman, who is, among other things, a collaborator and has a National Medal of Science in the US, is a systematic way of being able to reduce high dimensional data that happen to live on a low dimensional manifold to a low dimensional manifold. So what you see here, they call this the Swiss roll for, I don't know why exactly it is a roll, but why Swiss, I don't know. You see that you have three dimensional data that live on a ribbon. Uh, it is very clear that there is no hyperplane that passes through these curved surfaces. So there is no way that you can reduce it to two dimensions with principal components. But by creating an eigen problem that is based on, a, on random walks on the data, you can realize that this is really two dimensional and you can get through an eigen problem a couple of here, a couple of coordinates that, as you see, one of them parameterizes the length of the ribbon and the other parameterizes the width of the ribbon. So if you have high dimensional data that happen to be on low dimensional manifolds, these days there are beautiful techniques for being able to find what is the effective dimension and to give you a good parameterization. So these are the variables in terms of which we want to write our equations. And so now I want to kind of go a little bit to ancient history. This is something that happened uh, well, almost 30 years ago. Uh, this is a paper that has a rather horrible title, Discrete versus Continuous Time Nonlinear Signal Processing of Copper Electrode Dissolution Data. It involved experiments at the lab of Jack Hudson, who was a friend and collaborator and was not with us anymore. And what was done there is that we had lots of time series from dissolving metals in acids. And what you see here is various of these time series, each one at a different dissolution potential. So you see that we go from a constant reaction rate to an oscillatory one to a messy oscillatory one. And down here, you see the time delay reconstructions of the attractors. You see you have steady states, limit cycles, period doublings, chaotic dynamics, and so on and so forth. The point was, how do we get a model based on these experimental data? 
And so what we did back then is to get inspiration from numerical analysis and create recurrent neural networks that are templated, inspired by, based on traditional numerical analysis methods. You see, if you take a runge kuta, which you always, you all, we learn as undergrads, uh, in order to integrate the differential equation, what we do is that for an initial point, we evaluate the right-hand side, then we take the result, multiply it by a small number, add it to the initial condition, evaluate the right-hand side. So we do it again and again. And you see very naturally, if you have data that come in discrete time, yn and yn plus one, you take the data, you pass them through a neural net, you get the result, you take this, add it to the initial condition, pass it through the same net, you do this four times. This is a recurrent neural network. If you want a long short term memory network uh, that if you train it successfully, what it learns is an approximation of the right hand side of the differential equation. Um, so we use these in order to be able to learn parametric neural network differential equations that were able to reproduce the time series, reproduce qualitatively the attractors, and we're able to give you a bifurcation diagram from the data-driven problem. The data did come from doing nonlinear principal components, that is by using autoencoders. And what I wanted to tell you about this, uh, it's a little bit sour grapes, maybe if you want, but it's also interesting. What I showed you was a residual network, a ResNet, that was based on a runge kuta method. So uh, what is the idea? You have an input, you pass it through a neural network, you get a result, you multiply it with a small number, you add it to what you have, and then you have the prediction. The paper that I showed you that was a runge kuta resnet for learning differential equations is a decent paper who has, which has maybe 90 citations over 30 years. Uh, it turns out that the neural network that is based on an Euler template was published in 2015 by people at Facebook. It has 79,000 citations, and that is maybe not because it's forward Euler, but because they found the right use for it. They actually found that by learning not the time one map, if you want, but by learning the generator, the right hand side that generates this time one map, they were able to do significantly percent better in image classification. So it is the application, if you want, that made the big difference. But still, the successful architectures of contemporary neural networks are very much based on our very well established numerical analysis. ResNets are forward Euler and convolutional neural networks are finite different stem cells. So one of the things that is important and maybe does connect a little bit with, with Sargent's philosophy is that a, a good knowledge of traditional numerical analysis is a tool that not only helps you model differential equations, but also helps you understand the successful architectures that are proposed today by computer scientists in machine learning. Uh, the same ideas we used also for not just only learning ordinary, but for learning partial differential equations. I mean, after all, what's a partial differential equation? Here, a parabolic one. It is a function. Uh, it's, a, it's a constraint between the time derivative of a field at some point and a few of the spatial derivatives of the field at some point and some parameters. So if you have spatiotemporal data, it's very easy to learn the right hand side, the operator that embodies the partial differential equation. So this is again something from 1998. Uh, you take local spatiotemporal data, you use something like finite differences to estimate local derivatives, and then you train a neural network which gives you the time derivative based on the local spatial derivatives. And so what you see here is a version of what then got to be called convolutional neural networks. You have your local stencil, and then you have the stencil for the next point, the next point, the next point, and you combine all of these to learn the right-hand side of the partial differential equation. And uh, this is just a little demo. This is a viscous burgers. It's a childish thing that we did back then. What you can do is that you can take spatiotemporal data and learn the right-hand side of the differential equation. Now, I wanted to show you something that is not from 1990s, so this is maybe a little more, more, more modern. Suppose that you don't have the macroscopic partial differential equation, but what you have is microscopic agent-based molecular level simulations. How can you learn macro PDs from micro? And I chose as an example uh, E. coli chemotaxis. 
you may know, and if not, it's very interesting to find out about it. There's lovely uh, YouTube videos of the motion of them on the web that E. coli move by having a number of flagella, typically six. If they all rotate counterclockwise, then they are a little like a little propeller that make the, the cell move. If they move clockwise, then they kind of fly apart and the cell tumbles until they again kind of go, go counterclockwise and it moves. And uh, there is lovely mechanisms that allow you this system to do a bias random walk so that if they go upwards a food gradient, then they will turn to run more and tumble less. Uh, but what I wanted to show you in the spirit of today's talk is a little bit of what I've been telling you up to now uh, in, in, in action. What you see here on the left is uh, 5,000 bacteria. Each bacterium is a set of 16 stochastic differential equations that have flagella and probabilities for flipping and turning clockwise and counterclockwise and blah, blah, blah. And what you see in the middle in green is the food gradient. In blue is the density of the bacteria when you start them. And as we're going to run forward, the red will be the agent-based simulation and the blue will be the black box chemotaxis PDE that we learned with the tools that I kind of outlined. So let me play the movie. What you see, uh, in, in, so uh, remember blue and red are the actual stochastic 5000 bacteria versus the learned PDE. Uh, their color, blue, yellow and green, has to do with whether they are going to the left, they're going to the right or if they're tumbling in green. And basically all I am trying to tell you is that if indeed there exists a macroscopic partial differential equation, then you can learn it black box if you know what the right observables are. Let me also say one slide for another thing. Suppose that you are pretty well knowledgeable about a part of the operator. So let's say you know the diffusive part, but you don't know the chemotactic part. Then it is very easy to orchestrate this into learning if you want physics informed or physics infused or gray boxes, as they used to be called. Here is another version of the same simulation, which is equally qualitatively successful, in which we know some parts of the operator and we only don't know some other parts, like what, for example, is the chemotactic term. I, so I've told you so far about uh, no equations and no variables. The equations come from machine learning and the, no var and the variables come from data mining. But uh, I'm not going to say very much for no parameters, but I wanted to show you this. In 1981, as you see here, there was a miracle. Uh, uh, B.C. Moore uh, was the one who managed to construct using singular value decomposition. He was able to do balanced realizations. Uh, balanced realizations came from uh, aligning the controllability and observability subspaces. So it's a data-driven method that gives you a minimal and robust realization, alas, for a linear system. Uh, we are working on nonlinear versions of this, and a lot of people are working. So create nonlinear, minimal, and robust input-output realizations. Uh, but what I really wanted to talk to you about today was this kind of more funny, no space, no time part of the data, of, of the research. So this is a map of Germany. And there are two different ways of observing it. On the right, uh, you see seven cities. And on the left, you see a very strange way of observing these seven cities. On a given day in October, you go to each one of these cities and every five minutes you record a zero or black if the sun is not up and a one or a yellow if the sun is up. And so by working this way, you get a long Boolean vector of zeros and ones for each one of the cities. And if you do principal component analysis on these vectors or something even fancier like nonlinear principal component analysis, then you find that two principal components are important. And if you plot these Boolean vectors on the two principal components, you see that you get back something that is almost one to one with Germany, certainly a small deformation of what Germany is. So what this tells you is that if you do not observe physical space, but you observe an activity that is entangled with the space, an activity that is related to the space, then you can reconstruct the space even if you did not have it. And um, here is something that happened in 2011. Uh, DARPA had something that they called a shredder challenge. They took five documents 
Uh, one of them was a handwritten memo, like you see here. One of them was a sketch. One of them was a typed page. And they shredded them and they put the shreds out on the web and asked people to put the documents together again. And within a month, I think, there was a company from California that claimed the $50,000 prize. And this is something that any one of these finishing undergraduates can do now in 10 minutes. Uh, this is really the mathematics of puzzles. How do you use smoothness to put puzzles together again? And so here is my little thing about how to find the right space from data. Think of this as the output from your computer when you solve a one dimensional in space and time partial differential equation. Think of these things as, let's say, temperature patterns that happen in space and time. As the data come out of your computer, you take this page and you pass it through a shredder that shreds it in long longitudinal pieces, so in time series. And then what you do is that you shuffle these time series and you get something that looks like this. So the picture has become a mess because you have lost the space label of where everything was observed. However, uh, this is a little puzzle. And if you look at every time series and then you look at what are the two time series that are mostly close to it, then then look at what are the ones that are close to them. Then it is very straightforward to do a very simple data mining calculation and figure out what the original space was. As a matter of fact, if you are a little observant, you will see that the pictures are flipped because if you do smoothness, you can find the two time series that are closest to you, but you don't know which to put to the right and which to put to the left. So it should be clear then for this that it is possible to reconstruct space or something that is one to one with space, even though you have lost the label of space. And this is the same idea in two dimensions. You take a partial differential equation that depends in two dimensions and time. You pass it through a meat grinder. You get lots and lots of messy time series. You do data mining on these time series. And lo and behold, what you get is something, a, an emergent space, a space that comes from data mining that is one to one with the physical space. And so I want you to now, I want to show you now an example where this is useful or interesting. What you see here is a whole bunch of all to all coupled oscillators. They are going to start running in a moment. Each one of these guys is a little unit. They are all coupled to each other. They are all a little bit different. You start them at all kinds of different places and you run them. And then you see that they organize themselves along a one dimensional curve that is out of their activity comes something that looks like a space, the location of them along this arc length. If we, we don't know this when we start, but after we look at them for some time, we realize that it is there and by processing the data, if we look at the angle and the radius of this oscillation, plotted in terms of this variable that we did not know at the beginning, but that came out of data mining of the behaviors themselves, then we realize that the solution can be thought of as a partial differential equation. So what we have is lots of coupled units. They don't live in any obvious space, but by looking at their behavior and data mining their behavior, we can get them to look as if they are discretizations of a partial differential equation. Same idea, this comes from old work of Strogatz from Cornell in the 90s. Um, here what you see is a whole bunch of different initial conditions for all to all coupled oscillators. Think of them as molecules if you want or as cells that are coupled in a medium. If you run them, you see that they organize themselves and if you plot it the right way, like as you see here in terms of this data driven variable, then it looks like a partial differential equation. What am I really telling you? You look at the behavior of a complex network, and then what you can do is that you can construct a space in which the behavior of this complex network is smooth. Here is an example. This is 1,024 Hodgkin-Huxley neurons. They are not all to all coupled. They're coupled in a messy network. This actually has something to do with the Prebertzinger complex. It's a, it is a simple mathematical model of a little, little, little chunk of the brain that is not an interesting. Uh, and what you're going to see is that each one of them does a slightly different oscillation. So down here, you see 1,024 different oscillations as they are coupled together. 
Why are the oscillations different? Because each neuron is slightly different in their kinetic constants. And also because each neuron is structurally different, it is coupled in different ways with different other neurons. But if you analyze all of these trajectories, then you find that really it is a two-parameter family of trajectories. And actually, if you plot the dynamics of this complex network in terms of these data-driven space, this emergent space, then you see that it looks like a smooth evolution. And now, this is the interesting thing, now that we have discovered a space in which the network is a smooth PDE, then we can go and use the same idea as before, but now in an emergent space, we can learn a partial differential equation that describes this complicated network. And this is what you see here. On the left, you see the neurons from 1 to 1024 just going up and down in a messy way. On the right, you see a partial differential equation that describes the evolution of this network learned in an emergent space, a space that was discovered by data mining the neuron behavior itself. So uh, this is a slide from a talk I gave a few years ago at the Newton Institute in Cambridge. It all looks very weird and very medieval. It, it, it looks a little bit like a crystal ball. We take the data, we ask for predictions, we get predictions, but we don't really understand mechanistically what is it that we are doing. And um, uh, the understanding, if you want, has moved from understanding the physical mechanisms into understanding the algorithms that process the data in order to create models based on smoothness. And in what I told you before, I just messed space and recovered something. Uh, here you can see the same idea, but now shredding the PDE in time that is being able to, 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 to take, take, if you want, take a movie, shred it, mix up the images and then being able to put it back together. So it's possible not only to reconstruct a smooth space, but also reconstruct a smooth time. And in general, why the one or the other, one can take little chunks of space time and make a real puzzle and then use the same puzzle solving mathematics to create space and times that are appropriate for looking at the behavior and making it look smooth in them so that we can model it in these emergent spaces. So the main idea here, this is what you see here is a traveling wave uh, that this has something to do with surface waves. Um, but what I basically want to say is that if you look at the behavior, whether you sit at different points in space and look at little time series, or whether you sit at different points in time and look at little space images, or whether you look at little patches of space time, or whether you look at even traveling observers in the behavior, there is a systematic way of taking all of these different observations of same things of the same thing and fusing it together. And um, so the idea that one is able to fuse very different observations of the same phenomenon is something that would allow us to, let's say, think think on the so let's say that this is the truth on this axis. And, and I observe two different events in the true intrinsic space with a little sensitivity around them, with a little noise about where they happened. And let's say that this is my view of what happens. This is my model, my glasses, my observation, my instrument for observing the truth. And since my instrument is not one-to-one -one with the truth, then the distance between the two events will be different and also the noise around the two events will be distorted. And if somebody comes and has a different model or a different instrument, then they're going to get again a different distance between the two events and then a different deformation of the noise between the two events. But the idea is that if I observe both the events and the deformation of the noise around them, then it is possible to, in effect, construct a sort of a lens that is be able to take distances between events in my space and distances between events in your space and then we can create a data-driven mirror that allows us to create observers or fusers if you want that would be able to map observations from one instrument to another instrument one model to another model one um uh, how to exactly say it uh, um, uh, if you want uh, m m uh, the fusion of information from different observers, as well as the fusion of uh, different models, let's say at different fidelities. Uh, the magic in all of this is something that is called the, the Mahalanobis metric. 
uh, which is um, something that looks not just at the um, not not just at the data themselves, but also the deformation of the noise in uh, at uh, of a little local noise in the neighborhood of the data. This uh, local noise covariance, if you want. Um, this is a little sketch that I did to try and discuss this. I also am looking at my time and see that I am close to finishing. So let's say that this is the truth, uh, Newton, if you want, and this is what we measure, the shape. But it is possible to have the same measurement and it is not Newton that we are observing. Uh, the idea is that if we jiggle a little bit uh, the light source, that is, if we not only observe Newton, but observe Newton while we're jiggling a little bit the light, then we don't only get his shadow, but we get a little variability of his shadow. And the variability of his shadow is very different than the variability of the shadow of the vase. So the idea is don't make your measurements just by themselves. Have also a little bit of a jiggle of the process with which you got these, your measurements. This is something that one allows you to fuse information from different instruments, fuse different models together, uh, that is being able to register different representations of the same thing. Uh, we are working a lot on this. Uh, I, we have neural network architectures that do it, as well as uh, first principles, mathematical formulas for doing it. Maybe this is not so important. Uh, what I do want to kind of wrap up with is to tell you that for a very long time, uh, people made a huge effort in describing what they observed. So you see here in, in the Renaissance, for example, people were able to, they, they discovered the perspective, the point at infinity, that parallel lines meet at infinity. So this is the school of Athens. Um, and, and, and here is Plato, Plato for that matter, and Socrates. Uh, but the point is that after photography, and, and people put a lot of effort in being able to describe exactly what they saw. Uh, this, is a, this is by Dürer, and you see how much effort they did in order for the perspective to be correct on the painting. But then photography came along, and it was not so important to be accurate, and then people started doing impressionistic things. They started to plot the same thing in different weather, or how it would look if you have a different mood. And uh, the basic idea then is that if you have a measurement and you have a model of it or a mirror of it, you would like the mirror to look exactly like what you're measuring. And a lot of our models have exactly to do with what we are measuring. But if you have a slightly bad model, if you have a slightly bad mirror, then it will give you a deformed version of the truth. The idea is to kind of take this backwards, that is to look at different models as being distortions of a sort of platonic truth. That is, try to create a mirror that will take, not, not a mirror that will distort the truth to something bad, but rather, if we have different models at different fidelity, be able to construct the mirror or the calibration that will take them to a platonic truth. And the idea is that by doing something like this, we can also use this technology that I told you to fuse models at different fidelity or observations from different instruments back to what the universal truth, if you want, is. So what I'm trying to say that is that in my mind, the biggest advantage of being able to work with data science is that we do not have any more to be completely exactly mapping our models to the truth. It is possible to have mediocre models but be able to calibrate them. It is possible to have slightly different models, but be able to harmonize them. And in general, the idea is that machine learning and data science allows us to work not only with the things that we directly understand, but allows us to work with the same mathematics on things for which we don't exactly have words and on things for which we don't have little nice symbols for the operators like derivatives and integrals, but still be able to go back and forth between the truth and the models we construct. So what I will finish with is uh, this idea of gauge invariance, that is being able to model with all possible transformations of a model, and then being able to choose the model that is best for computing, or best for understanding, or best for predicting. This is a book uh, called In Other Words by Jun Lahiri, who, who, who has a Pulitzer Prize, and many of you maybe know of her and her work. Um, at some point in life, uh, this celebrated author that had uh, 
Pulitzer Prize for her novels in English, she decided to start writing in Italian. And the book is called In Other Words, In Altre Parole. And uh, if you think about it, translation is the ultimate gauge invariant thing. Whether you hear something in English or in Greek or in Italian, you should be able to understand that you're reading the same book or that you're hearing the same speech. So if you want uh, registering different fidelity models is a sort of translation or calibration, as we would call it in engineering. So she writes this long thing, this long and very articulate book about translating from one language to the other, taking things from one in instrument to another instrument, taking one model to another model, and then she has this afterword, and I will just read you a couple of things about it and we'll have only one minute left, I apologize. So she writes, in 1939, 15 years before he died, Henri Matisse began to move away from traditional painting and develop a new artistic technique. It involved cutting up pieces of paper that had been painted in gouache in various colors. Matisse combined them and arranged the different pieces to create an image. You understand these are pixels on our screens. He fixed the elements first with pins, then with paste, often directly on the wall. He stopped using the easel, the canvas. His main tool became a pair of scissors rather than the brush. I think there is an analogy of this between what we do now. We go from differential equations to data-driven models. For Matisse, cutting was not only a new technique, but a system for thinking about and expanding the possibilities of shape, color, and composition, a rethinking of his artistic strategy. The painter said the conditions of this journal are 100% different. He compared his method, which he called painting with scissors, to the experience of flying. I think that what we all, the whole world does today is painting with data, modeling with data. We follow the thread between the new method and the earlier paintings. We are aware of a turning point, a radical move. And what I thought I would finish is the same picture from the beginning saying it would be really, I wish I had a chance to talk with him about all of this. And I wonder if he would smile. Thank you and sorry for running over. Thank you very much, Janice. That was a wonderful talk. I think there's a bit of echo. Um, which took us really from uh, science, including uh, biology, uh, engineering systems, and uh, also uh, art, uh, from uh, Matisse to Mickey Mouse as well. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't. I, we have time for maybe one one question. If there are any questions, um, please post them in the Q and A. Um, in the meantime, I'll um, maybe ask you a question. Um, when we think about engineering systems, we're very interested in design on the one hand, so designing things we haven't made before, so for which we have no data. Um, also, in some cases, if we're looking at process units, for example, we may not have a lot of data available to us because they only run under certain conditions. Yeah. What do you think are the challenges there and the scope for applying those techniques? Mm, yeah, so uh, I, I do not have a good answer. The main tool in almost everything that I've told you, obviously, is smoothness. So uh, unless there is unless there is some reason for underlying smoothness, then everything becomes extremely difficult. And one of the things that's really interesting uh, is, and, and you know this from, from Chris Fludas, who is, uh, of, of all the things that are easy to do in a data-driven way, uh, global optimization is the one thing that's bloody difficult, because how are you going to do an underestimator of something for which you don't have a good expression? If you're going to sample long enough to have a good underestimator, then you've solved the problem and you don't gain anything. So I, I should ask you, the main tool in everything I said is some reason for some smoothness somewhere. If you don't have that, all the stuff that I'm saying goes out of the window. That doesn't mean that people have not been very successful with it anyway, but understanding what the algorithms do, it requires a sort of smoothness in some representation. Okay. Thank you. And we have one question in the, in the chat, um, which is, I'm interested in the discussion of translating models and how models correspond to a ground truth. The applications discussed today mostly deal with a continuous space. Um, so the smoothness you were, you were talking about. How do your observations change or stay the same when in a discrete space? So just okay. Uh, yeah. So the, the, so uh, let's talk about it afterwards. I I really don't know. I I would like to believe that all the problems for which people are successful in discrete space, the, the discrete space is a discretization of something smooth. I, I know this sounds naive, 
Uh, if you know something better, by all means, please tell me. Thank you, Yanis. Um, thanks very much. We'll stop the conversation now, but there'll be more chance to talk uh, during the Q&A. Uh, and I'll now um, give a brief uh, discussion of the evolution of the Sargent Centre uh, since its creation in uh, 1989, so it's uh, 32 years old now. Um, so as some of you may know, the Centre was established following a call from the Science and Engineering Research Council, CERC, uh, at the time, uh, from the UK government, asking for proposals to establish interdisciplinary research centres. And uh, the core principle was that this would bring a team of uh, a range of disciplines together to tackle large scale scientific problems. It was unusual in that the funding would last for 10 years, so a very long stable period of funding, but those centres had to become self-supporting thereafter. And from the get-go, the government put a lot of emphasis on the importance of industrial input. So there was um, industrial partners uh, present on the steering board, for example, involving the governance of the centres, and it was important to also uh, gain industrial support for the research, uh, up to 50% of the funding put in by CERC. So Professor Sargent was uh, very excited by this call and uh, decided to put together a team and a proposal to it. Um, so Professor Sargent had studied chemical engineering at Imperial College, uh, both at the bachelor's and PhD level, and he then went on to work for Air Liquide for seven years in Paris, and so that gave him a very good understanding of industrial challenges. He came back to the UK in 1958 to take up a position at Imperial College, and he held many leadership positions throughout his career, uh, but most importantly, and as Yanis pointed out, it's really his influence and the excitement that he's put uh, to the people he interacted with that uh, form part of his legacy. So in particular, he had a very well developed vision for what computers could achieve in chemical engineering, um, even in, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and that vision is something we're still working on realizing today. Um, and he also has a fantastically uh, influential academic family tree with over 2,000 people um, working in academia or industry on that tree. <clears throat> so he brought together a multidisciplinary team of people from chemical engineering, electrical engineering and biochemical engineering across Imperial College and UCL. So those two universities were working together from the get-go. And the ethos of the centre was really to be a collaborative research centre where people would come together to do groundbreaking fundamental research, but with, that was also industry relevant. And the reason people came together is because they were interested in systems thinking, in mathematical modelling and in advanced algorithms. And that remains the case today for members of the centre. If we look at an early report from the centre, um, hopefully you can, you can read this. Um, on the left, you see the mission of the centre, which was to pursue research into an integrated approach to the development of computer-based techniques for design, operation, control and management in the process industries. So quite a broad remit. The centre was quickly uh, working at full speed with about 80 um, researchers and 17 academics. This is today over 200 researchers and 33 academics are members of the centre. And it did very well early on in garnering the industrial support it was seeking, with as many as 25 of the fundamental research projects benefiting from industrial input. So what were the themes of these projects? Well, the fundamental program was divided into four areas, all related to process systems engineering, including synthesis and design, operations, control, modeling and numerical methods. Uh, the major projects that um, the centre also undertook, had a more applied stance and they included integrated process design, batch processing and supply chain management and they really helped to work closely with industry. So the centre um, had many research outputs and was recognised for the quality of its work in the Queen's Anniversary Prize about 10 years after its creation uh, in 2002, where uh, the citation highlighted the excellence in research, industrial collaboration and translation of the centre. Now, one of the main examples of translation of the research to, uh, to practice is, of course, GPROMs. So what you have here on the screen is um, a snapshot from 1992 of the uh, GPROMs user manual. Um, and in, so this was at the time a research code, which was used by some of the industry partners. 
In 97, uh, the company Process Systems Enterprise was created to commercialize GPROMs and, and other software as well. Um, and that company was uh, bought in 2019 by Siemens. And what you can see now on the right is uh, some screenshots from the latest version of GPROM, so something looking a little bit more user friendly um, and also, of course, with many more capabilities. So here's an example of really fundamental research going to industry. In 2002, the center received a prize for its work, but this was also a time of change because, of course, the funding from the IRC grant ran out, and this was the period when the center had to become self-sustaining. So the members of the center undertook a strategic review, and these are some slides from that time. And what you can see here is that the mission actually didn't change very much. Uh, it's, it stayed focused on the design, control, and operations of the process industries. The research program still included a fundamental component with the areas you've seen before, as well as the technology transfer component, with um, some trialing of different approaches to achieving um, this, um, this technology transfer. Um, and what is really important, though, is that there was much movement towards multi-scale systems at the time, and so the research program evolved to recognize that by considering working at much more uh, detailed scales, like at the meso scale with fluid dynamics or um, at the molecular scale, but also at larger scales, looking at enterprise-wide or global trends. And in order to be able to carry out research in this area, we asked new members to join the center and bring their expertise. In particular, we called on domain experts who could bring us an understanding of molecular simulations, for instance, or of biological systems of fuel cells and so on. So if you look at the center's research today, um, you can still see vertically the uh, fundamental areas or competence areas, but you can see that these have been broadened. For example, we just have we have process design, but also product design. Operations and control also includes autonomous systems. The modeling and model solutions tools really spans all of the scales from molecular to the very large scale of the world. Um, and computational optimization is complemented by machine learning. And then we have application domains, and those have also evolved to fit today's needs from industry and society. The research program is shaped by interactions with our industrial consortium, companies that really help us to understand what the needs are today and from major partnerships of focused programs of research. And then we still work to put out um, the outcomes of our research uh, through secondments, uh, graduates, prototype software, licensing, through spin outs, in particular an increasing number of spin outs from our students as they graduate or before they graduate and short courses. I just want to give you a flavor of some of the application areas that we look at. Um, Nigel Brandon mentioned some of these. these. Uh, so for example, in the space of sustainability, we have a major program with Sainsbury's where we look at their overall strategy for sustainability, but we'll also look at technological innovation, for example, towards heating or cooling systems in the stores to try and improve at, at the level of the store. Um, and we also look at water management across Sainsbury's, including rainwater harvesting. In a totally different area, but which uses the same basis of process systems engineering, we look at vaccine manufacturing. So this combines understanding the biology um, of the manufacturing together with, um, with process systems aspects. And so we look at optimizing the process and increasing yield, minimizing the cost of vaccines, but also distributing the vaccines to people who need them. And looking ahead, we've been working very hard on developing uh, some smart manufacturing ideas and, and the factories of the future. And this really builds on, on what Yanis has been talking about, but also what uh, uh, some of the words that Murphy is going to, to take up, take, tell us about in her talk next. Um, so how you combine your understanding um, of systems and models with data to support decision making and develop better, better systems. So hopefully what you've seen uh, through the 32 years of the centre is an evolution of the ideas that were um, at the initiation of the centre of uh, combining fundamental advances in process systems engineering with application to practical and industrial problems. So uh, this slide here gives me a very good opportunity to introduce our next speaker, 
Uh, in fact, if you note, many of the words on that slide are actually um, in her title, systems thinking, sensor systems, models and digital twins, more than buzzword bingo. So I look forward to that. Uh, but before that, let me just uh, say a few words about uh, Professor Dan Murphy Calder, uh, who is Vice Principal and Head of the College of Science and Engineering at the University of Glasgow. Um, Murphy is a computer scientist uh, and she's interested in computational modeling and automated reasoning for complex interactive and sensor driven systems. Besides her research, she's been very active um, in many aspects of, of government and research funding. So she has been on the UKRI EPSRC Council. She has been Chief Scientific Advisor for Scotland. Um, she uh, is currently on the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology and on the REF Main Panel B. Um, her work has been recognized by a number of awards. She's been a uh, Royal Society Level Home Research Senior Fellow, and she has uh, won the Suffrage Science Award in Computing Science and Mathematics. Murphy, thank you very much for joining us today, and over to you. Thank you very much. Can I, despite being a computer scientist, I'm not entirely sure I've got things working here. Can you confirm you can see my slides? Yes. And you can hear me? Great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire, so much for inviting me today. Um, the first talk was just fabulous. Thank you. And the slide that you just finished on, Claire, couldn't have been a better introduction for me. So, so thank you. So what I'd like to do here is um, this is going to be a little bit of light relief um, after the first talk. It's um, almost a talk by cartoon, but I want to explore some high level ideas about what do models mean in the context of data and digital twins. And, and I come from a background of modelling process and modelling in discrete state. So it's really kind of the opposite side of the world, but now I'm meeting, um, now I'm meeting data and a whole lot of buzzwords. So, uh, like the previous speaker, I would also like to acknowledge many good people who've um, helped me form many of these ideas, although they, these are my, my ideas, they don't have uh, responsibility for them. But in particular, uh, all my collaborators in the EPSRC funded Science of Systems Software, um, uh, Science of Sensor System Software program grant, um, and that includes Julie McCann, who is just along the corridor from you at Imperial. So hello, Julie, if you're listening to this. Anyway, here we go. Maybe. Sorry, I'm trying to. There we go. So I want to start off with a personal view of Digital Twin, which I think is perhaps more liberal than many others. But I view Digital Twin as a model. But it's more than a model in that it depends on data that is sensed from an instrumented world. And for me, it's quite important to think about the instrumentation. And the purpose of the model is to deliver, to deliver feedback into both the system and to policies and policy makers. So it's about decision making. That's the purpose here. Some of my colleagues refer to the monitor audit predict loop. We are monitoring what is happening now, we're auditing what has happened in the past, and we're trying to predict what will happen in the future. For me, the key question is right down the bottom here. Is on the left, it's what and how do you instrument your system is going to influence and be influenced by what questions you can pose and answer, and then what you can modify as a result of answering those questions. So now we get to the cartoons. So I'm going to start off with a plain old model. On the left, I have a system of interest, may involve people, assets, processes, and I make an abstraction to them from, from them to a model, which involves mathematics and, and in my case, computation. Um, it, it, and by that, I mean coming to life. Um, and I can ask questions of this model and I can test hypotheses. And the answers to those questions um, are going to inform how I'm going to modify um, a policy or confirm a policy, or can also inform how I want to modify the people, the assets and the processes over there in my system. I should say a lot of my academic life has been all about on the right hand side, which is how you ask the question. 
for example, using um, temporal logics and, and model checking to answer the, the question. And in my experience, one of the hardest things when I'm doing work in application areas is to tease out the questions that people want to ask of their systems. They always say they want a model, but it's very hard to get them to articulate why they want that model, what they're going to do with it. So that's a plain old model. Then recently, well, actually it's more like 10 years, I've been looking at online models. And by that, again on the left, I have the instrumented um, system of interest. But now, my model is going to reflect the current state of the system by feeding into it sense data. This might be periodic or event driven. Um, most of the systems I look at are event driven. So again, we can ask questions and test hypotheses. And again, we can mo modify um, policies and processes, but also key is we can now also modify the instrumentation. That's important. And another thing down there on the bottom right, sorry, I don't, don't know how to do a digital pointer here, is because my model is online, it's a reflection of the current state of the system. I do reasoning from the current state. And here's a little cartoon to illustrate the difference. Mostly when we do modeling in plain, when we look at plain old models, we reason from the initial state. And that's often some you know, wonderful state at the beginning of a system. So I've indicated that by green, in green. But when we reason from the current state, we are reasoning from a state where quite often we are not in an ideal situation anymore. We have system degradation, we have failures, we have all sorts of things have happened. And what, but what might be very important is that we understand, are we nearing what I have colored red over there on the right hand side, some dangerous state, some unsafe state. So th there's some notion of envelopes of, of behavior. And that's what an online model gives us is the ability to say right from, from where I am in this state, what's going to happen in the future. So moving on now to digital twins. What's the difference? To my mind, there's not a big difference, but there's some subtle differences. Again, I have the instrumented physical and digital world. I have the model. I can reason from current state. It's an online model. But additionally, I'm actually doing some analysis of the data as it's coming in and informing the online model. So this is where we classically detect and infer errors and inconsistencies and what um, some people in computer science call situations as opposed to data context, which is more the raw data. Situation refers to a semantic value. You know, is that are you about to is this a dangerous event or is this indicating um, likely um, movement into it into a dangerous state? So this is my overall schematic view of a digital twin. Now, a little bit more detail. I said a cartoon. Here's a different kind of cartoon. I'm unpacking this notion a bit. Over on the left, again, I've got the system of interest and I'm sensing from it. I'm, I'm now focusing a little more on the sensor system, the networks of sensors that are delivering the data. Got to think I want robust data. I've got to interpret that data in a semantic way. I'm updating digital twins. So what am I doing? Inferring model parameters and updating online models. So in all of this, perhaps implicit, but I didn't say explicitly, I have assumed some encoding of a process, of processes. Um, and then I'm doing analysis. But what I'm trying to bring out in this picture is also the decision making part of this. So remember, analysis is informing decision making. That may be, there may be degrees of autonomy, it may be totally autonomous. There may be also elements of human um, interaction there. So I've labeled that human autonomy teaming. And then the key is there's this feedback. So there's actuation and sensing going on here. So sensing, actuation, models, analysis of those and human decision makers. Now, a little more detail. So now in the left hand side, I'm thinking about the system that I'm instrumenting. And now I'm thinking, well, this is actually a little more complex because 
the artifact, the system that I'm interested in may actually be the result of construction, may be the result of a process itself. Think about smart manufacturing, high value manufacturing. I've got an engineering process that I will um, instrument itself. It is then producing an engineered artifact. That artifact may also be instrumented. Um, hopefully somewhere I have some ground truth for both of those. But as I said, I've now got sensing of both the artifact and the process of constructing that artifact. And I've got actuation of both the engineering process and the engineered um, artifact. And then even more detail, it's getting more interesting. I look back at that, the system of interest. The engineering process is most likely going to be interacted with by human beings in most manufacturing processes. So I have human users interacting with the engineering process. And the artifact that has been engineered or produced there is likely going to be interaction with that artifact as well by human users. So one of the things, for example, I look at is um, human users in, in, in mobile apps. And what I do is, is we use logging software to log um, hundreds of thousands of users interactions with this mobile app. And of course, um, and, and, and try and um, infer models of user behavior. So again, I've got lots of sensing going on here of, of multiple processes, some of which involve humans. And I've got actuation again of the engineering process and the artifact. So just to look at the caption at the bottom, it's about sensing actuation, models analysis, human decision makers and human users. Right, maybe a word about analysis, because that's the thing that interests me greatly. What questions do you pose and how do you actually um, answer those questions? So I just listed some things that for me very important is functional properties. Does your system do what you expect it to do? We have lots of performance behavior, for example, the time and resource it takes. We may have to run simulations. We may want to talk about stability tolerances, confidence intervals. I don't, I'm sure I don't need to tell you um, the kinds of analysis that we might do. But let, let me just unpick that a wee bit. So I think I just said this, it's which questions, how to express the questions and how to answer the questions. And I'm just going to look at the which questions. I think the how to express and how to answer is about another four talks there. Um, so let's just unpick what questions are you going to ask in the kinds of systems that I've just described in, in a digital twin setting. And we've been thinking for a while about what we call frames of reference. So the, this is an attempt to um, qualify the context in which measurements, judgments and interpretations can be made. And each frame articulates a different perspective and the dimensions and measurements that are specific to that perspective. Or another way to put it, it's a lens through which to organize and balance multiple views of the system. And I think it really forces you to think what is the purpose of my system and what is the purpose of my model? And how do the two relate to each other? So I'm going to give you a description of some of the main frames of reference that we have come across. Here we go. The first is what we call the geographic one. It's about the spatial and topological relationships of sensors and data. Where are your sensors placed and how do they relate to each other? And we also have the physical uh, frame of reference. And this is concerns the underlying natural science that affects your system behavior. So your sensors may be placed in a physical environment, you know, in water that is flowing, in a pipe that is constrained, um, in a field, um, 
on people, on moving agents, on a lamppost, etc. And you may require the physics of the environment in which they're placed. You may require to reason about and, and ask questions about. Then we have security. What are the vulnerabilities, the threats and their mitigations? Failures. What are the components that can fail? Um, how do they fail? Do they degrade? Do they operate incorrectly? A classic problem, of course, for us is to be able to, to tell the difference be, between um, incorrect uh, operation and, and just weird circumstances. Uncertainty, what are the acceptability bounds and how do we quantify them? Social frame, the interaction between users, between users themselves and users and the system. Because most of the systems I consider have human users somewhere in there. Temporal frame. What are the timing constraints both within the system itself and the validity of the model or models over time? Particularly relevant when we talk about um, inferred models. Economic frame. What is the quantitative resource consumption, production and discovery? You can think about that from energy to, to money to bandwidth to, to storage. Privacy. What about anonymity, identity, authentic, authentication of personally identifiable information and controls on disclosures? And finally, because I couldn't fit any more on this slide, a legal frame of reference. Um, what are the obligations, permissions, responsibilities of system components, users and regulators? Here's a little example, for example, on, on the left, you might think about the temporal and failures frames of reference. How does clock drift affect um, duty cycles and synchronization? On the right hand side, you can think about if you buy cheaper sensors, how is that going to affect the readers, uh, uh, your readings um, and, and your judgments? So you'll be delighted to know, Claire, I'm on my last slide. <laughs> so concluding thoughts. I started off with this high level thought is what and how you instrument your system influences and is influenced by what questions you can pose and answer and how you might uh, modify aspects of your system. Um, I think this also helps reinforce you think about what's the purpose of your system and what's the purpose of your model. And I want to conclude with just a little hint about something I haven't really talked about here, but implicit in here, there's a notion of a digital twin stack that perhaps at the bottom, which is actually the top here, is we have network sensors, we have data context and situation, we have interdependencies, we, uh, another word is called the processes, the resources and effects, we have the system capabilities and self-reflection, we have, may have self-modification of systems, and at the very top level, most abstract, we have the strategic effect or the purpose of the system. And for all of this, I propose that frames of reference help us to ask the questions, uh, uh, to pose and frame the questions we should be asking about these systems. And I'm delighted to say that's my final word. Thank you. Shall I sh stop sharing? Yes, you, you can stop sharing. Okay, thank you very much for a very interesting talk from a different perspective to, to what we are used uh, to. Um, we can take one or two questions or maybe a question from the uh, um, chat, uh, if there are any. Uh, maybe I'll ask one um, to begin with. Um, so you started, you know, I wonder to what extent you can use prior knowledge of a system um, in closing that loop. So in deciding you know, if you have some knowledge, but you haven't built the system yet, as so you can't observe it, uh, to what extent can you use that knowledge to decide what to observe um, and, and keep that loop evolving um, in the digital, you know, in your digital twin? So I would say in my world, that's exactly the starting point. I start from a prior knowledge and a hypothesis about the interconnections and the process, and that's my starting point. And that's the difference from the totally data-driven world. 
who, who there there would be no hypothesis there. So I'm starting from my hypothesis, and the reason that is is because I'm very interested in systems where we have designed them to, to an extent that, that we actually have an we we engineered them to fulfill a purpose. OK, thank you. Uh, we do have a question here. Um, so in your opinion, which systems are well suited to be linked to a digital twin and which are the most challenging? <laughs> so I would say, first of all, the ones that are most suitable is where you are open minded about how you want to do decision making, that you actually wish to be more informed about how you about how you might make decisions. There's sort of no point in doing this if you're not willing to change how you make decisions. That's that's the first one. The second is, I think um, the validity, the reliability of data is very, very important. For, for me, quantity of data is not so important, but it's about the validity of, of the data. Um, can you trust the data is, is really very, very crucial. Thank you very much, Murphy. Um, we can now switch to the panel discussion. Um, so we um, and there'll be more chance to ask the speakers question in the panel discussion as well as uh, additional panelists. So uh, the question discussion will be on opportunities for process systems engineering. And I'm very uh, pleased to hand over to Professor David Bogon, who is Deputy Director of the Centre and uh, Pro Vice Provost at uh, University College London. David, over to you. Thanks very much, Claire, and thank you, Muffy, for a great, uh, great talk there. So we've got uh, half an hour or so uh, for some questions uh, for uh, our three speakers. You've been introduced to Muffy and uh, uh, Yanis, um, the, the speaker. The, the the third one then is Salvador Garcia Munoz uh, from uh, Eli Lilly, I think, aren't you? Um, John Perkins was supposed to be also on the panel, but he got called away for a family emergency. So it's just uh, just the three of you. So I'm going to give the uh, the audience a little moment to um, put some questions in the chat. I'll be seeing what's in there and pick out the ones that seem to be most popular. You can vote if there are some that are in there. But I, I might start off by um, asking you all uh, a, a sort of general question about the, the, the success of the centre. And um, certainly from what you've seen, what you know, what do you think are the factors which which can be linked to the to the success of the centre and maybe the success the success and how that translates into funder and government policy for successes of centres in general uh, maybe i'll start with you muffy <laughs> from what you know about the um, the activities and what we've been doing you're on mute i'm afraid <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. Could you just repeat the last bit of that? I just lost it for a second. That's right, fine. What factors you think uh, have, have contributed most to the success of the centre? And therefore, how, given that you know your background is um, uh, in Scotland and so on, um, how that translates into the success factors of other centres as well? Right, I think the first thing that I, I really clocked what was so impressive is that it started off with 10 years of funding. And that's really quite unusual. It's certainly very unusual in these times. And um, sorry, as someone who used to sit on EPSRC Council, I would like to thank the, the good um, people at EPSRC who had the foresight to say, let's kick this off with a big 10 year grant. And I think that's made a, a, a really significant um, difference. Um, The timing, I suppose you have to just think, the timing couldn't have been better. Um, so a decade ago, we were all thinking about, uh, I think, um, different scales was the key question. And I, I think we just hadn't anticipated how data was going to be so available over the following decade. And the part, partly that's through sensors, of course, but not only the availability of data, but the huge advances in machine learning, which happened, you know, sort of almost simultaneously. And the, I think these three factors together have just combined to make just a, you know, a stunning center. Mm -hmm. and, and bringing together, to my mind, what's really exciting is it's the physical world with mathematics and computation at the same time. 
Great, thank you. Sal, do you want to say some what you think? You've you've been working with the centre for some years. What what do you think some of the critical success factors? Let's say. Hi, thank you, David, and thank you uh, everyone for having me here. I I'd say one of the most critical success um, skills in a centre that that will thrive and create value for both, you know, the government, the, the public, and the companies that have invested in the center is, is the ability to listen, uh, you know, listen to the, the industrial participant, and, and I'm being selfish here because I'm the industrial participant, mm -hmm. uh, but listen at what are the real problems, right? Um, it, it is, it takes a lot of humility, I think, on both ends, you know, the industrial to recognize that the academic might actually have a good idea on something that is new and the academic to recognize that us industrials don't undergo lobotomies when we leave the school. Right? We actually have ideas aside from funding. So when that dialogue actually happens, right, and and both sides recognize the the mission of each other, right? The industrial recognizes that the mission of the university far and foremost is the student. You know, we're confirming we're educating uh, researchers and the university recognizes that the industry, you know, has has a practicality need. When that dialogue happens, I think great things occur. Great. Yes. You're on mute. So I I have a different perspective on centers by the way they are funded here, but what I was going to say is something that I think is common. Uh, that center has managed to attract and keep very good people. Uh, I know because we've tried to hire some of them away from you and did not succeed. Um, so I think that the fact that you can uh, recruit them when they are available and keep them when they stay there, that is one of the big things that is important for the success of the center. The other thing is that, uh, but again, I, I, I say this as an impression, less than knowledge, is that it seems to me that this center from the beginning always had as a great importance in what it does to listen to the non-lobotomized, as you said, Salvador. Uh, it, it was always very important that the problems were real problems, not just the ones that the academics would play with. And and they did it for themselves, not just for you and for the resources that you would give them. Great, thank you. So we're not getting uh, questions from the audience here. Um, I will, uh, I'll ask another one, see if we can uh, elicit some more. I'll just make a comment on Muffy's point about timing. Of course, that also goes back to the timing of Roger's vision in the late in the 80s, which led to the to the to the formation of the center and it's uh, the, the the nucleation of those ideas. The time was just right for it then. I mean, I go back right to the pretty much to the beginning as well. So as it happens. So uh, an, another question then, um, maybe this is to Sal um, uh, particularly. I, I was just wondering if you actually seek to hire or are more inclined to hire uh, an applicant with a systems engineering background and whether that's a, um, a benefit or not, and whether it adds a, a, an extra dimension. Yeah, I think um, for, for, the, for the pharmaceutical industry, which is why I said one of the most critical um, skills, I believe, of, a, of an applicant is the ability to truly thrive in an interdisciplinary team. Right, so it's not a team of people who are experts in one aspect. You know, if you're designing airplanes, or you need to know that. Um, in in the design of a, a pharmaceutical, so many fields come together, and and the the problematic is so incredibly complex. The human body is such an incredibly complex machinery. Right, the effect of how a chemical will go into the bloodstream and have a therapeutic effect is so complicated that truly there is no way you can slice and dice that without a, a systems approach. So that capacity to untangle this complicated mess and try to address it piece at a time in, in what is the depth that is necessary to solve the problem at hand. Um, you know, I, I personally believe that this, the systems thinking is absolutely essential and it is a differentiator that we will see in an applicant. You know, of course, we have many different positions. We have positions that are very, very specialized in a particular field as, as necessary. 
Uh, but I, I will say in the field of engineering, the systems thinking is a differentiator, absolutely. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. Um, for you, Yanis, I mean, it's, um, yeah. Well, do, do, so this, this is a funny question. Uh, do you think that the student that that the students that we have that the good the good students with all of this knowledge will go to the industries that we typically work with and support or will they go to the huge salaries and the promises mm -hmm. of glory that they get from uh, you know from from facebook and google and who do take the systems people exactly because they know all the same things that they know that you are interested in I, I think there's the evidence. I mean, I'm not, it's not an opinion, right? It's the evidence. Um, and of course, you guys know better where your students go, but from an external observer, you know, me seeing you and other centers of systems training, um, definitely Google is making a lot of <laughs> good hires out of these groups. You know, Amazon and Google are hiring a lot of students from this field. You know, it's, um, in, in the in the field of hiring students, it's also competitive, right? We are we are competing with Amazon. You know, they want to hire optimization experts as much as you know pharmaceuticals and oil and energy ones. So it it's hard to compete. I I think the students, you know, if you allow the stupid question, do, do you stand a chance? I if, think we do, and and it depends, right? It depends what the student is looking for. Definitely, in looking for a career. Um, there is the personal drivers. I, I can tell you, I left the petrochemical and polymer industry uh, market as a whole to go into pharmaceuticals, and I had a personal driver for that. Um, you know, we stand the chance because at least, uh, and, and I know I'm speaking from the pharmaceutical sector, uh, but any company that puts money into a center, right, for the purposes of research, I think has at least that noble intention of doing research with universities, and, and that is attractive itself, right? Um, okay. Let, let, me, just... let me ask you again on, on, on the same, if, if I may please yeah, forgive me. Please, please, so, please. Uh, uh, again, this comes in parts from ignorance, but in parts from interest. Mm -hmm. Are you, I have this impression that what, uh, the pharmaceutical companies do is that they will wait for the two out of the 50 startups that will be successful in designing something and will just buy them. Forgive the naive impression. Is mm -hmm. To what extent is that true and to what extent is that not true? Uh, that is a very interesting question and I think it depends on what specific field, right? Um, in, in the field of systems engineering, I don't think we see that that often. If you look at the major, you know, centers around the world, not only CPSC, but if you look at CAPD from Carnegie Mellon or the TWCCC in Wisconsin, it, it's not like they're spinning companies, you know, very quickly. And it's not like those companies are getting bought by pharmaceuticals. So in, in the systems area, I don't think so. I think we're looking for individuals who have the interest because honestly, you know, pharmaceuticals, we're, we're, it's, it's hardest for us to compete because we don't only compete with Google and Amazon, we compete with the energy sector. Um, so, you know. Yeah, I, I was thinking more of drug design, not so much of. Uh, of I was going to say in drugs. the area of drug design, it's a totally different ballpark, right? Where, where companies develop small molecules and they get bought off by, by pharmaceutical companies. Um, that is definitely happening and it's, uh, you know, I'm not disclosing anything confidential. I'll just read the news all over the world and you can see this happening. Now, to what extent the portfolio of a given company depends on those purchases, I do not know. That that would be definitely something strategic from the company to do or not, or to rely on those, you know, purchases to maintain a portfolio. I, I don't know, you know, what the different strategies of each company is, but it is something that happens. Um, I doubt that it, that's the way, you know, you could sustainably maintain a company. I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, let me um, proceed. There's a couple of other questions uh, that I found in the chat here that are a bit more 
So uh, one from Joan Cordiner. What's what's your thoughts on the use of soft centers that come from soft sensors that come from the data where the measurement is difficult and there can be uh, and, and then can be used for control? Maybe we'll start with Muffy. Um, so to some extent, I don't suppose I care about what kind of sensor because I, I'm, I'm thinking when you mean soft center, I, I'm, I'm of course sensing digital processes, you know, just like physical processes. Um, the key question, though, is when you said measurement is difficult. So <laughs> I'm, I'm immediately thinking, yeah, on what basis are we going to be using that data to inform our decision making? So we do have to be very careful about that. Um, and, and maybe that comes back to that earlier question. Where, where's the domain that's good and likely for a, a digital twin? It is where we're getting good quality um, data, whether it's periodic or event, to actually inform our model and, and where the state, it, the state is. Because I'll just come back to the whole point for me about digital twin or online, it's that model tells me which is the scenario from which it's important to reason. If I just reason about the system in the abstract, you know, there, there are so many system states, it's very unlikely I'm going to pick the one or the class of ones that's in, important to the particular system that I'm, I'm concerned with. So on this one, I remember that the first time that I heard about the, I mean, of course, making nonlinear observers um, across sensors and measurements is something that systems people are always interested in doing. But one of my math collaborators that works with people in neuroscience said that uh, that was maybe five, six years ago. And I don't know how well I will represent it, but at Yale, they have one of these centers for studying epilepsy. And if you put somebody in the fMRI, then you can apparently look at the appropriate neurons. But then at the same time, they were measuring everything they could from the twitching of their eyes to the calcium and potassium in, I don't know, their tears and sweat and whatever. And the basic idea is, yes, you're going to have a little bracelet or you're going to have a printable shirt or you're going to have a whatever that is going to measure these 300 things and tell you what it is that the fMRI would measure if you were in the fMRI. So, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, one of the big things here is that you're going to have a hundred little measurements that are going to tell you the thing that you need the huge instruments to measure based on all the data that you have. A, a funny way of me trying to say this sometimes in talks is, um, if, if, if uh, I, I, I was giving a, a, a talk at the university where there was a young assistant professor that had a baby and I said, do your in-laws come to visit from time to time? And they said, uh, well, yes. And then I said, uh, you know, to take care of the baby. And, 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 and I said, wouldn't it be fair to say that observing whether you go to buy milk at the store is a measurement of whether your in-laws are in town? Uh, the basic point is but if that yes we're going to be able to infer all kinds of things without being able to measure them directly based on all of this computing and data science which is what you asked i guess is is it going to be a, is there going to be a lot of it absolutely all the time a lot do, sorry do, do mind if i just Bring, come come back in. Um, I think what we're meeting is a fascinating combination of engineering and science. So engineering is where we have a purpose for a system in mind and we want to build a system to fulfill that purpose. And science is where we observe a system. And typically we've done science on systems that have evolved naturally where we don't know what, how they were designed. We are trying to reverse engineer. And engineering was for you know the things we wanted to to build in future. And I think what we're seeing now is these two areas are coalescing, because and we're we're building more and more sophisticated engineered systems. You know we built the internet, we built the software, but sometimes we don't. You know it's totally deterministic. We just <laughs> we're just not entirely sure what it's going to do next, <laughs> even though we designed it. So we now have to throw in some observations about it as well. So I'm going to, that's a, quite a nice question that sort of follows up a little bit from that actually, um, or in some ways anyway. We're experiencing an area, an, an era dominated by machine learning, data-driven methods and generally a rise of software. What do the panelists think about how this will impact the importance of domain knowledge and the role of the engineering professions? 
So, so, sorry, would you would you repeat it? <laughs> it's a long one. Yeah. Uh, we're experiencing an era dominated by machine learning, data driven methods, and 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 the rise of software. Okay. The specific question is, what do the panelists think about how this will impact the importance of domain knowledge and the role of the engineering profession? So I, I think you can you can answer the question in generally in the impact of machine learning and it and so on, as well as this thing, this point about uh, domain knowledge and it and how important that is. So the, the question is, will we have a job in 10 years? I think that might be behind it. <laughs> I worry about it. <laughs> Muffy. I don't worry at all. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. We need humans to be designing systems, etc. I am not getting on an aeroplane any time in my life that it was designed and flown by observing data. Absolutely not. Domain knowledge is as important than ever. What it means is you just have to learn even more now because you need to learn about machine learning in addition to all of this, how to use it wisely. You don't need to know the mechanics of it, but you need to know how to use it responsibly and wisely. So, that's my answer. Can I just say amen to that? Um, <laughs> it, it is it is a struggle and the struggle is, you know, where, where I think that the big problem is we don't differentiate big data from informative data. And you know, not because you have a ton of data, it means it's good and it's gonna be useful at all. I, I fully concur that if we want to solve the next challenges that face that humanity faces, we need to know that we need the domain knowledge. We know that that's not gonna go away. If anything, I agree it's made our job harder because now we need to explain why why an aerial net doesn't know mass transfer and that it's a lot easier if you use your principles of mass transfer than fitting an aerial net. So yeah, it does that's not gonna away, you know. Um, it's it's very much relevant. It's good to hear. <laughs> so uh, another popular question, which is uh, not so unrelated, actually. Could you comment on one of the common challenges for many process systems engineers, the lack of practical knowledge and expertise in a particular application area? Methods and tools rarely work off the shelf in practice and need much tailoring. Sal, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, one? I can take on that. I mean, it is it is that is why it's so important to have industrial collaborations with a with a university program, right? So that you bring practical problems, real data, uh, to learn how these tools perform under real scenarios. Um, I, I think it is quite important to have the skill sets to work on problem because honestly, you know, when we say knowledge domain, domain knowledge. And in a particular application, even even that is kind of you know, questionable. I've been I've been working in pharma for quite a long time, and I tell you, every new molecule that comes my way has something different. It's never it is never just out of the box. Oh, hey, this worked before. Let's do it again. There is always a twist. There's always something different about this new molecule. Something different this new product that that makes you go back to the drawing board and look at those tools look at the domain knowledge and say hey how do we solve this one um it, it is it is important to have that industrial collaboration so that students can see real problems and i think the most interesting bit and we've seen this in, in our collaborations with the center is that sometimes the problem are not as elegant and complicated as the as the academic partner thinks they are they're a lot they're a lot simpler they're not easy they're just simple. And, and mm. that throws sometimes the researcher off because they think of this, you know, super elaborate, elegant, incredibly multidimensional facet problem. And the truth is it's not, it's very simple. Um, and I think that throws off people. Um, you know, the, the practice is, is simple. It's not easy and, and simple is not the same as, as, as easy, right? Uh, we have simple problems to solve. They're not easy problems, but they're they're rather simple. They're not as complicated and multifaceted as we think they are. Do, do you mind? Yeah, Muffy, Sorry. go on. Go I was about to say that's a really nice point, and I was about to make the point about complex versus complicated. They're sort of simple and easy, and complex and complicated, and they're different. Yeah. And the whole point is, see everything I mentioned today, sitting behind it is working in applications and working with industry all the time. Even though I'm a theoretician, I'm always challenged and informed by real problems. And and that yeah. makes the whole thing come alive and so interesting. 
And and I think it's rather interesting when we like the most interesting conversations I think happen when we bring a problem and we say, you know, this is a problem in in, in our academic part where we go, well, that's not going to work because because you know here's a theory it says you can't do it, and you're like yeah, but we have to. Like a decision is going to be made with or without the beautiful theory. <laughs> <laughs> so if your current theory says no can do need more information, I'll like say okay, thank you. But this is what we've got. You know, in some cases that's all the information we've got. So how can we make a good decision with this information? And and maybe the theory was built for the wrong problem, right? It's assuming you have information that in practice you don't have. So how do we solve this thing, right? Um, yeah, Liz. No, my my two cents in this is different. Um, uh, you can all see, you know, sometimes I say that our iPhone is a mutation. It's just an electronic mutation instead of us mutating in our head. What I try to, what I want to say is that you can all see that we can use a lot of information from a lot of people all around the world because of the connectivity that we have. And I want to say that comparably for things that have to do with experiments, you, you, or with more practical problems, you maybe don't need to go to the company and sit there for a year or two years. You can actually talk with them today and have much more of a sense in a way that was not possible before. You don't have to go and put that database in your head. You can be in connection. All that. So all I'm trying to say is that being educated on the more practical side, if I may say it so, is as much facilitated as looking for any new theoretical result that you don't really know. So uh, the way that we interact with you, if you want, is also changing very much because we can talk with you in the lab as you show something on any given day. I, I think I, your comment brings an interesting point. I think, you know, as a guide for, for any um, academic uh, researcher out there is look for problems in need of a solution. If you find yourself with a solution looking for a problem, that, that's that's not going to work. It's the other way. I, I do have a question for 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 Mafi. I in, in the thinking about the digital twins, maybe it's a very naive question. I wonder about who the caretaker is going to be, who, who is going to be the person whose job would be to make sure that all of these growing pieces are up to date, uh, are harmonizing with each other. Why, why am I asking you this? It has happened to me at least twice in my life that upward compatibility of software and hardware from previous generations of computers has truly in a medieval way hampered our being able to do. We cannot do sometimes things that we were able to do before because who is going to be the person whose job is to keep this functioning and alive? And I wonder sometimes in these rather large and complex digital twins, how they are, uh, how to put it, their, their, their continuity, who is going to do this? Yeah. Not the programmer who programmed it. I, I'm interested in what you think. As I say, so I was in the um, Blackett report on the role of computational modelling uh, a few years ago. <laughs> Go read it. <laughs> um, and we spent a lot of time thinking about roles when developing models. So there's the idea of who commissions, who wants the, the model, right? Who's going to develop the model? Who's going to, who's, who's implementing it? Who's developing the requirements? Who's maintaining it? And, and who is, who is cataloguing it? and communicating about it. Sorry, there, there are other roles as well. These are really, really important roles because you're quite right, because particularly you get upgrades on, on software all over the place and it's very, very hard to keep this control. But I know some in some places there is the actual notion of a model card that sits along beside any model that's used in an organization which records uh, many decisions concerning that model. and and. You, you basically you need documentation that flows with that and responsibilities. Let me elaborate. I, I'm really interested in this. So if, if very few years ago, there was a, a, a conference in Germany where somebody who was a technical VP for Volkswagen, I, I think, said the following thing. Um, all molecular biologists have in their labs 
the uh, uh, one, two, three people that, that are not professors, they are not graduate students, but they are the technical supervisors of the lab. They are the people that are essential into running the lab. They have careers doing this, okay? And what the guy said is that all you guys, like us computational people, you're going to have the corresponding lab. Technicians is not the right word. This is not just a technician, but you, you need these people who, as I said, they are not the PI of the grant. They are not the graduate student that comes and goes, but are the people that are, you won't say curators. I, I don't know what the right word is. There, and, and it was a very interesting question. Who educates these people? What are their career paths? Are we training people like that? We will, it's blatant that we're going to need them all the time in the same way that the lab people do not take only grad students from scratch or undergrads. And that is something that I can assure you that in the American system, at least, if you ever tried to say, I need such a person in a computational lab, they would probably laugh at the time. Yeah. And these are many careers and many jobs for many people. That's why I wanted to ask you since you. First, there, there's there's a, a movement in the UK to recognize the post. They're often called research software engineer. OK. Um, and you're right. It's really hard to get them funded. And these people are absolutely key to success and we need to recognize them more. Yeah. yeah. OK, I will go on to an, uh, another question. I'll be given a little bit more time. Actually, we have a group just like that at UCL, Murphy. You probably knew that anyway. But <laughs> um, uh, So from Sandra Macchietto, um, how do you know whether you have measurements or data or models sufficient to capture a system behavior and not just a subspace? Maybe we'll go to Yanis first. You're asking us if we are magicians. No. <laughs> uh, OK, yeah, this is in tongue in tongue. In, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, what is a decent answer, Sandro? I, I, okay. <laughs> when you have a numerical algorithm, you do a calculation with one step and then with twice the step, and then you estimate the error uh, based on some smoothness assumptions. Uh, you can have error estimates uh, by keeping subsets of the. I, I, I don't have really. Um, I guess I shouldn't have started answering. You don't know. <laughs> how do you how do you estimate error and uncertainty? There is a lot of tools these days for estimating uncertainty. What do you consider acceptable uncertainty? Depends on you. Uh, maybe maybe we can ask back. You obviously have something in mind when you're asking this because <laughs> there is no answer. So what do you want to answer to ask really? He can't talk, I'm afraid. Okay, he, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Muffy, I don't know if you want to have a go at that one. No, I <laughs> Not my area of expertise, but it's a huge problem. Yes. Yeah. How do you interpolation from the data points you've got? And, and where did you put those sensors in the first place? Big questions, really big questions. Uh, so I well. My 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 <laughs> my impulse answer is why do I care? <laughs> what is the problem being solved, right? What is the problem being solved? This question comes all the time. I teach multivariate analysis and all the times the question is, how do you know the measurement? How are good? I go back to what is your current headache? What are you trying to solve? Right? The, the, do you have observability into the unknown? Well, do I care? Right? Is, is what is the problem you're trying to solve? Do you have the information needed to solve it? The answer is no. OK, do some you do some brainstorming. What could you potentially measure based on your domain knowledge? Um, you know, and, and, and go from there. But if if I don't have a problem and you know it's not hurting, then why do I care? <laughs> OK, I think we the, might. The, the, the cheap answer is it's called UQ. <laughs> OK, I uh, thank you very much to our uh, three panelists, um, Muffy, Yanis and uh, Sal, and I'll hand back to Claire. Thank you very much, David. Thank you all. So I just have uh, a few closing remarks uh, to what has been a really enjoyable evening for me, certainly, and I hope for, for all of you. So first of all, I want uh, to thank very much uh, Yanis and Murphy for some really thought provoking <coughs> talks, which uh, we'll be able to rewatch on YouTube soon and uh, think about all of the directions that they've taken us in. It's been really wonderful. And thank you to both of you and also to Sal for uh, the very lively discussion. I'm really sorry to cut it short. There are lots of really interesting questions remaining in the chat, uh, which does mean we have to organize more of these uh, events. Um, I also want to thank all of our collaborators 
uh, at the center and sponsors and all of our friends who have made uh, the success of the center what it is. Um, I want to thank the Sargent family for its support. I know we have some members of the family attending tonight, so thank you very much. Um, and all of you for, for attending. If you've enjoyed this event, uh, you may want to engage uh, in other events um, in the center. And so you can find out what we're up to uh, through all the means shown uh, on, on the slide here. Um, we will be following with our next event tomorrow, where we have uh, Professor Mehong Wang given, from the University of Sheffield giving us a talk on systems engineering for carbon capture, utilization and storage. So you can join us then. It's at uh, 1 p.m. and you can find out more on, on the website. Again, a virtual event. Um, but finally, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I wish you all a, a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.